Mr. Ollie Watkins. What a wonderful week or 10 days, two weeks this guy's had. On Vibrify, we want to talk about people's journeys, get beneath the skin. Non-league, I think it, it just opened my eyes, really. We want to develop you two, three years and then move you on and sell you to the Premier League. And not, not many clubs say that to you. They ring you and go, listen, man, we've got a deal on the table for you here. You're going to the Premier League, baby. You're going to the Premier League. What's that like? Talk us through it. But like, you, you've got a great relationship with, with, with Jack. One, how good is he? And two, have you worked on that relationship and that partnership in training? Please just take us back to that moment. Explain it to us, you, the moment you get that call for England. Where was you? Who'd you tell first, etc. cetera? So I'm looking around thinking, Jesus, like all these top players, and this is where I want to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. You already know the vibes. Yes, guys, this is Vibe with Five. Please make sure you subscribe, turn on your notifications. Listen, today we've got none other than Mr. Ollie Watkins. What a wonderful week or 10 days, two weeks this guy's had. He's come from the depths of English football, non-league football, through the leagues, into the Premier League, took it by storm, banging in goals left, right and centre, and then caps it off with an international cap. Not only that, an international goal on his debut. Listen, man. Oli, thanks for coming on, man. We want to listen. We want to on Vibrify. We want to talk about people's journeys, get beneath the skin, talk about how they got there. But first and foremost, what a week! Yeah, um, I think if you saw my interview after the England game, you would have seen how much it mean uh, it meant to me. Really, like I didn't, I didn't expect to to be called up so soon, and then to go on and get a get a goal on my debut was just. Oh, I was just. Uh, I think it's only just. It's only just sunk in, really. Um, it feels just like my life just keeps going, and and good things are, are happening to me like each week. So um, I'm loving it, really. Listen, we're, we're going to come to that, and that's that. That's going to be. That's going to cap off this interview, yeah. But I, I want to rewind because I think a lot of the people you see, you see in our comments is a lot about the realism, the realness of the interviews that we do, and the conversations that we have with the guests. And I want to take it back to, to where it all started. And I spoke about early in the intro about you coming from the depths of English football, non-league. Talk us through them beginnings and, and how it started for you. Where did Ollie Watkins start? Where was you scouted to go into the likes of Exeter? Um, I think going all the way back now, it seems like a long story, but um, yeah, Sunday league, um, just playing with my friends I got called up my my club manager was uh, a coach at the Exeter Academy so he um, told me to come for a trial but I didn't actually get in until um, I didn't actually get in the first trial that I went to they told me to come back so I couldn't concentrate I still can't now to be fair but um, at the time I was just you know a little kid I just wanted to play football and when they were stopping and starting the, the small-sided games and stuff like that, I couldn't focus. So um, I went back two years later and, um, yeah, that's when I, I, I got into the academy. So obviously that's that 2014, you signed your first professional contract um, at Exeter on a two-year deal. What was that feeling like? Was that like, I've made it? Or was that like, this is... What, what was your mindset at that point when you get that deal? Um... Yeah, I thought I made it until I, until I had um, I can't remember. I, I saw a pro uh, do an interview and said like he hates it when young lads they you know they sign professional contracts and then they think they're a first team player. And I I, I went I used to go on uh, I went on the preseason tour to Brazil and I thought like back then I was taking photos like off to Brazil, putting on Twitter like ready to to. Um, experience the week and, and then come back and hopefully get three points just talking like I had already played and and stuff like that and it, it, I realized when I played when I was the first name on the team sheet that's when I you know I I was that's when I was a pro really mm. Ollie when you went on loan you went on loan to uh conference Southside at the time Western Supermare 
Now, a lot of players probably would assume if you're going on loan to the conference, is that kind of your level? But we've seen the likes of Calvert-Lewin has, has gone down to that level. Tons of other players have started in that level. Do you think it's an important step in player development to just go wherever you can get minutes in the early stage of your career? 100%. I think, you know, it's better than... I was, I was being spare man. I was sat in the, the stands, York away, thinking this is rubbish. Like, I was, I was better off going out and playing, and, and that's what I did. I, I played men's, men's football... Uh, 18, 19, and I think I realised something clicked that people were playing for mortgages, they get kid, kids to feed. It wasn't just about, you know, the nice tick tack football, like they say in, in the reserve team and your development. We used to play out from the back and uh, we lose the ball and the manager would be like, oh, you go on, go again. It's just, it was a different mindset. And um, I think for me, it, it definitely, it definitely helped. Exit is obviously not, Cat One Premier League Academy. Was there a massive difference in how you was treated as a player when you went down into the conference, or was it pretty similar? No, I think I was still respected, but um, I was I was still young, and I had to go out and get experience. So um, I think a lot of players have probably seen uh, young players coming from a club at going on loan and thinking, oh, it's just another loan player. But I didn't want to I didn't want to do that. I wanted to have an impact on the team. You know, they were struggling at the time. Um, so I just wanted to do the best for the team. And then obviously for myself, just try and uh, impress because I wanted to, to get back into the first team at Exeter. You've played obviously now. Have you played in League One at all? Because I know you played League Two, Championship and Prem. Yeah. You didn't play League One. Didn't, didn't play League One, no. How difficult was the conference, do you think? Do you think people underestimate it? It was actually the conference south, so it weren't the conference. But, um, yeah, it's had older older players, you know, ex-pros playing in there. There was players dropping out the league. I think they were earning more money playing, you know, semi-pro than um, in the league at the time. So there's still a lot of good players Um and it was just, yeah, experienced, clever pros that I, that I played against, really. And, and for me, who hadn't played much first-team football, um, it was a bit of a shock to the system. But, you know, I enjoyed every minute of it. Yeah, listen, man, we've, we've, had, we've had Ravel Morrison on before on the show. And he spoke about if he had his time again, he, he would probably want to go down the route that you've gone in terms of starting in the lower leagues and coming up because he'd feel that he'd appreciate it a bit more. He was at United and he just thought that this was normal being at a, a big super club like that and didn't really appreciate it. Do you think your route is 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 the better way up and you probably appreciate it a bit more? Yeah, I think so. I think because, you know, you don't have everything given to you at once. You know, at United, you're going into the training ground. It's got everything, you know, you're surrounded by superstars, there's media. If you scored a good goal in the FA Youth Cup, there, there's media all around you hyping you up. Whereas at Exeter, uh, you know, if I score a goal against Grimsby away, I'm not getting that. I'm not getting <laughs> that hype, you know. Uh, and I could just focus on football. Um, facilities weren't great, so you just you just get on with it. You, you just um, you live within your means. I wasn't getting paid great, um, but it wasn't about that for me I was just happy to to you know play football every week and 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 try and develop but what keeps you going the next day in training when you're like I've got to get to where he's getting to is it family is it your own mental strength like what is it exactly um so kind of like inspirations kind of thing yeah yeah just my family really like um just seeing what being in a privileged privileged position can do for like my family is just unbelievable. Like I think my goal is obviously I want to get better as a, a player um, and just to achieve, keep achieving whatever I'm, what I can set out to achieve and, and um, win things, but also, you know, provide for my family. I think when you can buy your mum a house and stuff like that, that's probably the best, the best feeling ever really. Um, and yeah, just win. And it's a bit like, I, I look at it a bit like golf, you know, I can, you know, the consistency, like one day I may have a stinker in training. So the next day I want to, I want to go in and work as hard as possible and, and just, and 
just be the best I can, really. Come on, Ollie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you this generation i think it's because of social media we 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 look at other people and we we think oh i, I want to be there do you have to manage your patience and did you ever get in that position where you were getting impatient and thinking i should be there i want to be there and kind of losing focus of where you're actually at at the time yeah i still do it now to be fair um i can remember there was a, f a few months ago before i think leading up to christmas I hadn't scored for I hadn't scored for a while, and I uh, we played Crystal Palace at home. Went down to ten men, but in the second half, I thought, you know, I, it's probably one of my best games I've played for Villa. Uh, I did everything but score. I think I hit the bar three times, a post once. The ball just wouldn't go in the back of the net. And um, El Ghazi said to me, like, bro, not even Ronaldo scores every game. Mm. Um, and I was thinking, oh, I'm not sure about that. I think he does, but he's like, look, just be patient. Um, and sometimes I got a you know, take a step back and think, you know, you've come a long way, like, don't put too much pressure on yourself. But also, I think that's one of my biggest strengths, you know, I always want to keep going and, and improve. So, yeah, you know, I just uh, I take it step by step and, 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 and go from there. Oh, well, listen, we'll, we'll touch on your work, work ethic while, now and here you are and what you're doing. I'm hearing great great things about how hard you work off the pitch, but has that always been part of your makeup? Was that as a, as a young player in the, in the lower leagues, was you like that? And, and was you sitting there with the mindset that I'm going to get to play for a Premier League club and, and play in internationals or was there little targets along the way to get to where you are now? Um, I think there was, yeah, small targets, but also I didn't want to put too much pressure on myself. So, it was kind of like a guideline, really. Um, but I mean, I am, I, it's only start recently in the last maybe four or five years that I've started to really work hard and I think about my body and stuff like that because before I used to, I was a winger, I used to just stand on the wing, wait on the touchline, wanted to dribble past people. Um, off the ball, I was useless um, and weren't really a team player. But I think... You know, it's the opposite now. I, I run around and put myself about, and that's the first thing when I when I step on the pitch. I think you know you've got to work hard and and leave it all out there. So when when did the penny drop? Then you said four or five years ago. What was there a trigger? Was there somebody in your in your team, in your management team, or in your coaching staff that, that made that that point to you? Uh, so at Exeter, uh, Paul Tisdale, my manager, he actually put me. He put me in um, number eight position and just said, literally, just run around and like just simplify your game. Because I always used to overthink it, thinking I've got to get four crosses in, I've got to beat my man three times, stuff like that. And going into the game, you know, it is good to set yourself targets, but I was putting too much pressure on myself, overthinking things. So he said, run around and head it, kick it, that simple. And um, I ended up doing really well. And um, after then, I ended up being a bit of a utility man. You know, I played left wing back. I played every position on the pitch apart from centre back and goalkeeper, really. Um, just because I was just, I then started working hard and um, leaving it all out on the pitch. Just to go back as well, you went on loan, didn't you, to Western Supermere? Yeah. Um, how. <laughs> I'm interested to find out like how you think about it because a lot of players they get they get shipped out on loan. I was one of them as well. And normally that loan is to a league lower or to a couple of leagues lower. Yeah. Um how did you deal with that mentally? Did did you feel that as a negative and that they they don't want me or was it a a positive that I'm going to play men's football with an opportunity to put myself in the shop window and come back a better player? Um well at the time I went with my best mate MJ. Um and I knew the manager thought highly, highly of him. Um, so I thought, well, if I'm going out with him, you know, he, he can't think I'm that bad, really. Like, he must trust me a little bit. And mm -hmm. he, he's going to want me to go out there and for us two to uh, express ourselves and, and get game time, really, because we just sat there in the reserves, not, not doing anything, not developing. Um, but as soon as I went to non-league, I think it, it just opened my eyes really just playing against men ex-pros just 
you know, I'm not playing against academy players anymore. I'm playing against um, men that that need to pay their bills. So um, something a penny dropped, and and um, I think it was massive for my development. Do you think that academy system's broken? That just constant, all the way up to age 23, just playing against the same kids in different teams all the time. Do you think you need that shock of something different like coming up against non-league sides? Yeah, I think it's... I think if you're not in the f- first team or even training with the first team at the age of 20, you know, time's ticking. That's what, that's what I think. I know players like Vardy got into the Premier League when they were late, but as a 20 year old, you can be out playing in a lower league team, getting games, you know, learning about things, learning more from losing a game than beating Chelsea under 23s, scoring a hat trick, winning 6 0. You can learn more from losing um, in a game that actually matters than a, a reserve team game. So um, I think it's massive, really. I think it. I think it's key. Like I, I touched on my my best friend MJ. He was playing in the the first team when he was sixteen. Um, look at Ethan Ampadu as well at Chelsea, sixteen again. Um, and players think that he's been around for a long time, but it's just because he made his debut at, at, at such a young age, you know. And now he's got that experience and 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 he's learned what it's what it's like to, to actually fight for three points rather than just your development in a reserve team game. Hmm. Wow. Um, you know, I want to start looking at the Brentford side of things. So obviously you're doing well at Exeter, you know, young player of the year awards, smashing goals, doing your thing. <laughs> Brentford comes along. Now, when they came through, how were they performing? And what was appealing about them when you got there? So Brentford weren't the the team that they are now. Uh, I think they just finished maybe below mid table in in the league. Um, but I saw how many players had kind of used the club as a step as a stepping stone um, and went on to other things. And they even said that to me: "Look, we're not going to keep you here forever. We want to u- develop you two, three years, and then move you on and sell you to the Premier League." and you know, not many, not not many clubs say that to you. You know, they they say, look, we want you to be here for the new stadium, bubble bar, and in five years' time or or whatever. But I think for me, they they saw me and they they knew they could develop me, and I think that was that was massive. And when you say they, was it Dean Smith himself when he was there, or was it like people at the board? Like who exactly? Yeah, um, the director. He, he said it to me, um, but also I, I met up with Dean Smith and straight away when I met him and, and Rich O'Kelly, mm. uh, his assistant at the time, I was just like, I said to my agent, Paolo, oh, I need to sign there. Mm. So, you, so, you know, being there, yeah, what, 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 looking back now, what was the biggest part of your game as a footballer, but also as a, as a man um, w- w- developed in that period of time for you? Um you're just playing against athletes. I think that's when I started to, that's when I really started to um, nail down on the gym work and, and you know, change my lifestyle really because not that I was living bad, but I thought I was eating healthy when I was at Exeter, but um, it went to like a new level when I, when I joined Brentford. I was then just doing pure leg weights two, three times a week, whereas at Exeter I was doing a upper body all the time and I thought that was that was going to help me so I think it was more the uh the mental side of it and um you know the athleticism that I that I needed um working on my body every day that's what was a a, a key thing for me and a big change so 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 what what was what was eating healthy in your mind at that point at Exeter compared to eating healthy uh, somewhere like Brentford where you've gone to a more professional environment? Because a lot of kids, you say you eat healthy, but I'll just give them a little insight as the differences. Um, I thought you could, after after a game, you could just eat whatever you want and um, because you've just burnt so many calories. Obviously, to a certain extent, you can, but not like 
I was still saying that two, two, three days later. Oh, we played on Saturday. I can still eat from McDonald's or, or, or something like that. So um, I don't know. It's just learning about um, that was probably the most important time after the game. What you put in your body, you know, you need to eat. You need to eat well because that's the most important thing. Recovery. So um, yeah, just just little things like that that I never really thought of at Exeter. Rio. What was what was it like for you? Um, for example, you're talking about eating. What's the difference between you at West Ham, Leeds, and United? If you can talk us through your eating, your your health change, shall I say? Yeah, I was pretty much the same as Ollie. I think that you you think you're doing the right things because of the level of club that you're at and the professionalism that you're you're around at the time. So at West Ham, the way home after a game, you stop off at a chip shop on the coach and fill a black bin liner full of beers for the lads on the, on the, on the coach. And you all have fish and chips or pie and chips on the way home. Now I went to Leeds. It changed slightly. Um, the canteen was a lot more health conscious. So that's influencing me on a daily basis, but still I went to United and then you see that there's another level and you think actually nutrition is a huge part of it. They've got a whole sports science team that are taking care of you as an individual as a team, you're getting shakes made up for you before and after games, certain vitamins put in your drink. So it's very, very different. And I mean, now Oli being in the Premier League now will be even above what I was doing because it's evolving so quickly and, and, and sports science has become a real fundamental key part of these guys becoming the elite athletes that they are. And they've got to be, they're so finely tuned now to play the way they do at the level they do that, that the nutrition is such a huge key part of it. What does your nutrition look like now, Ollie? Like, what are we talking on a daily basis? What sort of supplements? Um, because this is, again, this is what we're here for, isn't it? Let's be honest. What's behind the curtain? What is going into a Premier League athlete at the moment? So, hey, what's your fuel? Every single supplement, what have you got? Uh, car. I've got, in the morning, I have like a pill pot. So, I've got like Omega 3, probiotics, calcium tablets, uh, fish oils, daily vitamin. Then I take um, like an apple juice with a creatine um, because the creatine is going to like uh, help your muscles recover quicker when you're sprinting. So, um, yeah, we all take that as a team. The nutritionist gives us that. And then um, I've just got like a, a, a plan that the, I ask the nutritionist to send me. So I just have the same thing pretty much every day. Um, and then if I... If I get bored of it, I, I switch it up with a, a different thing. So I normally have um, an omelette on like toast. But if I get bored, I just have porridge. Um, just little things like that, really. And um, yeah, just all the food that's put out is is fresh anyway. So it's it's a healthy option. You've always got your, like your fresh meat and vegetables. So you get two or you get two meals a day at the club. Um, that's all healthy and all fresh there for you. So it's hard for you to to eat bad, really. You can't – when you go home, I, I feel like if I if I come home and have a biscuit, like I'm, I'm kind of like cheating myself. I'm throwing away what I've just done. So I just stay out of it. And, um, and yeah, just I just want to make my body the, the best it can be. And I know it will help me on the pitch. Now, you mentioned yourself, Ollie. When you got to Brentford, they were not exactly where they are now. So you were with them on the journey, you know, the highs, the lows. Then you get to the playoffs, man. Can you please explain what that was like, the feelings, you know, going into that game, playing against the opposition? What, obviously, we know what you were trying to achieve, but what was the feeling inside? Um, first of all, I just wanted to, obviously, you wanted to win, but I was thinking how it would feel to lose. Um, you know, I'd already lost in one playoff final at Wembley before and I just wanted to, I didn't want to get ahead of myself and think about oh, how we're going to celebrate. I was thinking what it would feel like to lose. So, um, you know, anything can happen in a final. We have beaten Fulham twice that year um, and we knew what like they were capable of. So you, you, you smashed it your last season at Brentford. I was reading up on you before, 50 games and 26 goals is like a phenomenal return, really. Obviously, you get beat in the playoffs against Fulham. And you say bye. You go into the Premier League, yeah. wave bye to the guys in the in the championship, and you hello, Premier League. Like, what is that feeling for you? Is it is that almost like I've got to where I've dreamed of now? 
Uh, what 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 are you feeling at that moment when that call comes through to touch on Odia, your agency? They they ring you and go, listen, man, we've got a deal on the table for you here. You're going to the Premier League, baby. You're going to the Premier League. What's that like? Talk us through it. Uh, I, I don't know. I, well, it was a shock to be honest. Paolo came to our house, my agent, and um, he was there with him for he was there for thirty minutes, and after that, we were leaving to go to Birmingham. Um, I, we went outside in the garden. I come back in. I said to my missus, "Pack your bags. We're going." She was on a work call at the time. She's like, "What? We can't be going. I haven't done my hair. I haven't done my makeup. Um, like it's crazy. It just happened so quick. Um, so it's like goodbye to Brentford that I've been at for three years, and you know, found my found my feet. Um, they made me who I helped me make help make me who I am, um, and you know, you're just off in, in one day and straight away through my mind, I was thinking, wow, 28 million. Like, I hope I, I hope I just, obviously I wanted to make my family proud, but I, I wanted to make the fans proud as well. I didn't want to be a flop. I didn't want to be in these articles where it's like, I didn't live up to his potential and, and stuff like this. So, so many things are, are going through my, my head at the time. Um, but yeah, looking back now, it was, it was, it was unbelievable. So you get to the Premier League, man, with a fee rising to £33 million. So it beat my 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 fee from years ago. Um, but what, I remember what it was like when I, I went and people were saying there must have been loads of pressure, man, the pressure of that price tag, etc. What was that pressure like for you? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's massive. You know, coming in to a team that hadn't done... Uh, that great the the previous season you know it was it was massive for me to to try and prove why I deserve to be there you know obviously I scored a lot of goals the year before and I wanted to try and implicate that this year um, and yeah I just wanted to to arrive at such a big club like Villa and and just prove to everyone why I deserve to to be bought for that amount of money Hmm. You know, you know, it was mad because when I signed, I, I was I didn't feel pressure from the fans or when I went out on the pitch. It was more like going into the training ground and showing the players and proving to my peers that I am actually good enough. Did you find that at all? Yeah, exactly. I was thinking, oh, I wonder what he thinks of me. Uh, yeah. You know, I didn't want to make a mistake. Uh, you want players like, you know, Jack and John McGinn, the main players to play international football. You want them to be saying, oh, he's good and um yeah i think it was more that obviously i had i haven't i still haven't played in front of the fans you know i'm, I'm still uh waiting for that day to come so, so what have been those big differences for you on a daily basis um forget the games i mean on a training pitch what have been the big you know things you've noticed that you thought oh wow that's not really what i expected or that's that's more than what i thought what what are those things been give us a bit of insight um to be fair, I haven't been shocked since I come to Villa. Um, you're still surprised at the. I was still surprised at the level of the the training, the, the intensity they trained at. Because when I was at Brentford, the the manager was really was really big on that. He wanted to kind of make sure we were working hard every day, and some of them sessions were so intense. But um, I feel like it's the same at Villa here. You know, everyone wants to improve. There's a good mentality in the camp and a closeness and um, everyone works hard at each day. So I, I was actually surprised about the kind of the intensity of, of the training. What's the main difference that you're seeing between players that you played with in the lower leagues, whether that be in Conference South or whether that is you know, League Two Championship and, and what you're seeing at Villa? Uh, I'd say that just the way they look well. The main thing is the way they look after themselves. Um, you know, they're not eating the food that I said about before. They're looking after their bodies. Um, and then also they think quicker as well. It's like when you're playing with players like Jack, he, he, before I've even touched the ball, he's thinking of, of other things. He's three steps ahead. So, you know, when you play with players like that, I think it, it helps you raise your raise your game and and... And yeah, you step up to their level. Do uh, you mention that there about someone like Jack and John McGinn being the main players and people that can feed you the ball? 
Does that make it easier for you? Are, you? are you still making the same type of runs you made at Brentford, but at the level of player maybe wasn't finding you as frequently? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And I think obviously the championship isn't as it isn't as uh, higher quality as as the Premier League. You know, the, some the defenders are smarter um, and and more athletic as well. So, you know, I think the timing for everything has to be perfect. Um, but yeah, players like them make my make my job a lot easier. You know, as a striker, I'm I'm reliant on my teammates to to give me the ball. Um, so. If, yeah, if they're not feeding me, then I can't really, I can't really do much. So I think players like that are massive for my game. And I think you've seen this year, me and Jack have linked up really well. When you know before his injury, we linked up well, and and he sees me. So I think that's he's helped my game, and I feel like I've helped his. Is is that is that something that you talk about off the pitch? Because people always ask me about my relationship with certain players that I played with. But like you, you've got a great relationship with 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 Jack. One, how good is he? And two, have you worked on that relationship and that partnership in training? Yeah, I think just whenever he, he's on my team, I always want to, I always look to give him the ball because I know he can he can do things with it that no one else can really, you know. Uh, that's, that's, and that's no disrespect to anyone else, but everyone knows that. So that's why he gets the ball. That's, that's why we try and give him the ball the most because he can do things that, that no one else can. So... I know when he's got the ball, I need to just make a run and, and he'll pretty much find me or or, or come towards him because he'll bounce it off me. Just little things like that. Um, we don't speak too much about how we're going to play and stuff like that, but that's what I like about it. we kind of got a, a good relationship where he knows where I'm going to run and I know what he's pretty much going to do with it. Have we seen the best of Jack yet, do you think? Or is there still loads more that you're seeing in training that he's not managed to get part on the pitch no i think what he does in what he does in training he does um he does it on the pitch but yeah i feel like he's probably just finding his mojo i've only i've only been at the club for you know a short a short period of time but um yeah he, he is he is a special player you're a striker and i'm always intrigued we had rude van Nistelrooy on the other last the other week and we talked about working on different aspects and different scenarios in training that you're going to see in the game maybe and how you've become, how we became good at scoring goals and whatnot. Have you got any things that you do at a training ground that you do, you, you do religiously and you just think I need to do this to go into a game in the right frame of mind? Yeah, I feel like if I've had a, a bad session or, you know, I, I haven't been tight with my touches and so I've had a stinker on the, the Friday before in the possession boxes and the small side of game. Uh, I always want to try and do something to to make me feel good or make that session better in my mind. So, you no, know, I always do finishing after, um, and she, you know, there's no better feeling than hitting the back of the net. So I just do different fi finishes, um, yeah, and just try and practice every day really because some days you know you may put five in the top corner and other days I may not score one. So I want to try and get that consistency where I can do it as much as possible listen man you, you've had a great season in terms of goals um, I think you scored 13 goals and 3 assists in 32 games for Villa um, please just take us back to that moment D explain it to us you, the moment you get that call for England where was you who'd you tell first etc so uh, we actually got a, a text a few weeks um, prior just saying you could be you know you're in the you could be in the squad, basically. It was like a, a short list. Um, and I was buzzing, I was buzzing. And I went into training and I found out seven of the other lads had got it. So I was a bit like, oh, <laughs> I, won't, I, won't get my head, I won't get excited. I won't get excited. So um, I didn't really think it was going to happen, to be fair. I had, um, we had a game against Newcastle. It was the last game before the international break. And um, second to last, sorry, but it's the last game before the squad was announced. Uh, I didn't know Southgate was, Gareth Southgate was at the at our match and um, I had an absolute stinker that game. <laughs> From the first minute, the ball's come up to me and, and normally I'm quite, you know, let the ball stick, but I just couldn't, I couldn't make it stick. Uh, so I didn't expect to get called up. Um, 
and I got a text from the, uh, the club secretary on the Thursday saying, hi, Ollie, can you call me? And a few days prior to that, she had said to me, oh, I've been fine for um, a certain thing. So I rang her up and said, oh, is it about the, the fine that I need to pay? And she said, no, I've got no news. You, you've been called up to the England squad. And uh, I couldn't believe it. My missus on a work call downstairs. There's no one else to tell. So I was just sat there on the edge of the sofa like, with my head in my hands. Uh, I couldn't believe it, really. I was just sat there. Um, but it was the best feeling, best feeling ever. What's it like walking in the, ho in the hotel? Because I remember that being quite a daunting experience, like who you see first, like how do you speak to people, getting your kit bag and stuff like what, what What's it like that? Yeah, it was, for a, well, for a start, I didn't have the England tracksuit, so I stuck out like a, a sore thumb. Like, yeah, here's a, here's a new boy. But um, <laughs> so I went in there and thought, you know, I deserve to be here. You know, you can't get called up to the England squad on luck. You know, you've, you, I've, I've worked hard. Um, so why didn't you have the tracksuit? So why didn't you have the tracksuit? Because I had not been called up before. Okay. So I, was, I got it when I got there, but um, yeah, I didn't have it. So everyone's setting up in their tracksuits, and mm. I've, I've gone there. I've got so many staff trying. It was like when I signed for Villa again. I was getting a medic. I was getting my heart scanned and blood tests and everything going on. But um, <laughs> yeah, it was it was manic at the start, but. You know, I just said to myself, just enjoy, enjoy it. You know, you never know what, what will happen in the future. So just, just make the most of it. So go on, yeah. the first training session, who impressed you? Who shocked you? Did you feel comfortable? <laughs> Was you nervous? <laughs> Shock me. Like I'm going to throw people under the bus. No, yeah. no, 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 not shocking. It's more no. like who surprised you. Like, you know, because when you go here, you know, you like, for instance, yeah. like Harry Kane, Harry Kane's, you know, his top draw. Yeah, and then yeah. when you get close up and you see it, you go, wow, the way he's a technician, the way he works, his intensity, maybe his professionalism, etc. Who else? Is there anyone else in there that, that you thought, oh, my God? Um, yeah, was, to be fair, it was a, a, a lot of them. I was, I was in the, the um, possession box and I'm looking around thinking, Jesus, like all these top players and this is where I want to be. You know, this is this is what I'm, I'm hoping for. So... Uh, but it was mostly like Phil Foden. He was silky. His balance uh, just gets out of tight situations where it makes it look easy. Um, and but it's not. Yeah, Mason Mount, um, another one, consistent. Always, he was always top in training. Um, never really gives the ball away. Just yeah. makes things look easy. Um, and then Declan Rice as well, who I think's massively underrated. It's like a, he's like a Rolls Royce. Mm. Yeah, I think it says it all. How did you train? Did you train well? Would you say yeah. that? Yeah, I, I think I, I left it all out there. Like I, I, I couldn't have done anything more. So I was happy when I come away with the camp. And um, yeah, I felt it. It was weird. I felt I felt less pressure being around them than when I do a Villa. So I felt like I felt like. I was just going into training thinking, you know, just just work hard and, and do what you can. But if you give the ball away, you give the ball away. Whereas at Villa, sometimes I go into training thinking I want to be the best player. I want to be the best player. And sometimes it doesn't happen because I want it too much and mm. I put too much pressure on myself. You know, I'm one of the only strikers there. So I know I've, I'm the man to, to score the goals. And um, sometimes I put, like I say, I, I put too much pressure on myself. Can we just, can we just, we've talked about your journey. We've talked about your transfers, your success, your goals. Can we just talk about the goal against San Marino, man? <laughs> and I knew that I'd give a smile to your face. First ever international goal. Take us back there. Um, yeah, so when I, was on the, when I was on the pitch, I think for the first 15 minutes, I didn't touch the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Please, please. I was doing everything. I was running to the corner. I was dropping deep to this, the the centre circle, like literally just for a bounce pass, and I hadn't I hadn't touched the ball. Um, Are you panicking at that stage? Yeah, because there was half an hour. I come on with thirty minutes to go, and fifteen minutes had already gone, and I hadn't had a shot or touched the ball. So 
I was thinking, please get me involved, lads. And then, um, and then it, it was, I could see it clear as day. I was on the edge of the box. I've, I've shown short to fill. And um, as I've taken a touch, the defenders opened his legs and literally just invited me to, to slot it through. And the keeper was so far over. It was like slow motion. So many things were going through my head at the time. And um, I was just waiting for it to hit the back of the net. And um, I think you can see by the reaction of, of all the boys when they ran over to me, how much it, it means to someone to score on their debut. Um, yeah, I think it's a special moment and something I'll, I'll be able to tell my kids and stuff like that. But also, I'm, I'm not content. You know, I want to I wanna score more now. That's what I want to hear. I love that. Was your phone popping off after? You must have been going nuts. Yeah, it's going crazy. Um, yeah, it's 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 almost it's, it is it is nice, but I don't enjoy it when my phone's like that because um, it's just it's it's too much to handle. I, I hate to see what it was like for you, Rio. Imagine if you had so if social media was as big as it is now back then. Do you, do, you, do you think social media is, is it? A, What's your relationship like with social media? Do you like it? Is it a hindrance? Is it pressure? What What is it for you? I think it is added pressure. Um, but I just try and manage it as, as, as good as possible, you know. I, I put myself in, say, like Ronaldo's shoes. He could come off the, the pitch scoring a hat-trick and someone's always going to say in the comments, yeah, but Messi's better. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, you can't always win. So I've just, I just manage it. I've, I've turned... The comments off I've just allowed my friends to comment you know they're the people I want to hear from at the end of the day mm. uh, because you know football is fickle so my close friends and family they're the they're the only people I want to hear from so yeah was it your girlfriend that, uh, tweeted was it your girlfriend that tweeted after the game or something like that As someone went viral and it was very emotional like yeah she she um she gets excited she tweets yeah. and stuff but also, she's on a journey with me. You know, I, I met her when I uh, just went to Brentford and she saw me when um, I had like niggly injuries. I weren't playing. I wasn't really the main man. I wasn't scoring. So she's seen me kind of rise up and um, enjoy the journey with me. So I let her, if she wants to tweet and be excited for me, then yeah, she can do it. Hey, right, listen, how important is it that structure around you? You've spoken about your, your missus there. Um, Paolo and the guys at the agency to touch. What, 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 how important is it to build that structure and have that real good ecosystem around you when the things aren't going well, when things are going really well? I feel like it's almost like I can't fail because I've got so many good people around me that like they're always going to pick me up and they're people I want to hear from, you know? Like, like when I said I had that stinker at Newcastle away, it's the people I want to hear from, you know, that are contacting me don't worry and it's mm -hmm. you know there's always another game I've got Paolo who will tell me what I've done well uh what I haven't done well and I won't take it personal um I've got my brothers I can rely on like my my best my best friends they're always there I, I've, I feel like I'm lucky I've always had a close knit of close knit group of people that I can rely on and I feel like they have played a big part in helping me get to where I am today because without them you know, I, I could have gone off the rails or and and let things get to my head. When you started this season, was England even in your thinking or was it something you was targeting over the course of this season? No, definitely not. Um, obviously, everyone aims to play for England, but I didn't think it would come so soon. Um, Harry Kane, Danny Ings had just come off the back of a, an unbelievable season. You know, Calvert-Lewin. There's so many talented players, you know, Rashford that can play up front um, and Greenwood. So there were so many players. I didn't think it would it would come so soon. So I think for me, I was just, you know, focusing on playing well for, for Villa. And, and um, yeah, not once did I really think of England. You see Harry Kane, and I know he's the captain of, of England. As, as a striker, was there much you learnt from sitting and watching someone like that who's who's been consistently at the top of the goal charts for, for many years. Yeah, definitely. He always keeps his, um, he always keeps his shots low and it's just so hard for the keepers to, 
to get um often when i'm cutting in from the left i want to bend it in the top corner but he's always looking it seems like he's always knows where the uh keeper's position is and he's always hitting it low where they can't get it so i think going forward that's what i'm just gonna i'm gonna try and work on what you're keen to do as well is to keep adding strings to your bow because i always when i talk to players and I, when, I, when i played i never wanted to stand still Never wanted to just be someone who people could work out. And is that something that you're really keen to continue? Yeah. Like I, I, want, I want players to go, oh, I don't know what to do because he can go in behind, but he can also come to feet and link the play. Or I don't know whether to show him on his right because he can can do a step over and go on to, and shift it onto his left. You know, I want to be unpredictable. So, um, yeah, every day I think... We're on the training pitch every day, so why not try and get better and, and be the best player you can be? And does that come from doing extras after training and working on those little key elements to add that you're looking to add? Is that what you do? Yeah, um, but it also comes to like hard work and mentality. I, I you know, I, I, I never feel comfortable. You know, I, I'm always kind of afraid. I, I never want to. I never want to lose what I have and I feel like I haven't achieved anything yet. So I'm always pushing on to, to strive for more and, um, and yeah, just trying to make the most out of training really, because, you know, it feels like yesterday I signed for Villa and it's, it's, it's already gone so quickly. It just reminds me of when I, when I played, I'm so, it, it's so refreshing to hear that, like to see that there's a, you got a, a sense, there's a fear of it all being washed away. Or losing yeah. that and it go slipping through your fingers where you've got to now. You've worked so hard to get where you are. And I, like I said earlier in, in the conversation, a trade that I'm hearing about you, obviously I know the, the, the guys who look after you, Paolo, and that as well. The, the trait that I always hear from people you've played with is your work ethic. How important is that for you? Is, is that something that when people mention your name, you want them to have that to be the, one of the next things that comes out of their mouth? Yeah, I think... You know, if you're going onto the pitch and leaving everything on the pitch, no one can really say anything. You know, if you've number one thing, as soon as you go onto the pitch, you work hard and and leave your all on it, then no one can really, no one can really comment and and say any, anything to you. You know, about the the fear thing, I, I think about it pretty much every day. You know, before I'm going to training, um, I don't want to go back to to where I started and. That's no disrespect to the players at Exeter or anything like that, but you know I've got to where I am. I don't want to. I don't want to go back there. You know I only only want to go up. So that's why. I, that's why I work hard to to do every day, and and hopefully I can I can keep going up. Which strikers are you watching at the moment and going? I want to add that to my game, or I want to add what what he does to my game. Uh, I think the. The top three that I watch, to be fair, I watch I watch a, a lot of them. But um, Harry Kane, Lewandowski, and, and Ronaldo. You know, Ronaldo, his movement in the box, he always seems to know where the ball's gonna gonna land. And just little things like he's always on his toes. He's not stood up against the defender, where it's easy for them to hold you and and not and stop you from getting a contact on the ball. He's always on the move and. Um, He's always he's always alive in the box, and I think that's such a, a hard skill um, knowing when the ball's going to land. But yeah, I think them at the top of their game, you know, they're clever. They they think quicker than everyone else. Oli spoke about the fear of losing what he's gained. Obviously, he's come from lower league teams. It's not been easy. It's a fight. You yourself, you've come from you know West Ham. You're at Man United at the time. How did it feel like every training session? Was it a different feeling to the likes of the Gary Nevilles who came up through the academy? What was your feeling? Yeah, a, a lot like Oli, what he fought with, with England as well. It's about proving yourself. You want to come off the pitch and your other teammates are thinking, I can't do without him. I can't go into a game. I don't, I'm not going into battle without that guy there. That's the guy I wanted to be. I wanted to be someone who the other players thought that I can rely on him and I need to rely on him. And I remember we, I won my first league title at Man United in my first season there, luckily. And I, I even after that season, I looked at it with a tinge of, I'm not an integral member of this team yet. They don't need me yet. If I don't play, do they miss me? 
I don't know. So it didn't even feel right when I won my first one. It was weird. It was so, and people kind of sometimes are you crazy, but I still felt like that, and I still felt I had work to do, and and until I, I was never, I was, I was never satisfied, but I was, I was. I felt better when I, I knew that feeling was around the squad and the other teammates. I knew that if I didn't play, they'd be sitting there going, it's not the same without him. And and I think that's that's, that's a positive thing to have in your in your system. We've obviously covered your journey up to now. What's the next goal that you want to smash? Yes. Um I wanna be I wanna be playing at least Europa League football with with my club. Um, that's the minimum, you know, S- stages, you know, they, we, they didn't finish great the season I was at Brentford. Um, but this year we've, we've improved and I feel like we could have done even better this season. So I want to help the team push up, push up the league even more. Um, and then I just want to be, I want to be a, a 20 goal a season man, you know, someone who's saying, yeah, he scores goals. That's what he does. Um, I feel like. Ten goals, ten goals is is okay, but you know I'm not I'm not satisfied with that as a as a striker. You know I want to be pushing twenty goals a season and and um, you know be a regular in that England squad. Last question for me, yeah, is is what important? What, what has football enabled you to do in your life outside of football? that you feel has been real important for you? I think just like I I touched on it earlier, just help provide for for people, uh, my close family and, you know, help settle debts and, you know, personal things like that. But no, it's something I want to touch on because I think, you know, I never, I never knew what um, my mum meant when she said, oh, there's a brown envelope through the, through the post. I never knew what it meant, but little things like that, I think, have, have helped me because I've been able to repay everything to her and my family, my grandparents. I sent them on a cruise for their for their 80th, um, and that meant so much to them, and they have so many memories of that and photos yeah. that it actually gives me more happiness, you know, spending that sort of money on them than on myself because... There's only so much. There's only so much you need and, and want. Hmm. I got another one. Just a, I reckon this one's a good one to probably wrap up on, on or near enough wrap up on. We got one of the best centre backs the Prem's ever seen here. Uh, I think it's a massive privilege that me and Joel get to absolutely pepper him with questions. Yeah. As a striker, what's the one thing you would want to know from his perspective as a defender that you think you could add something to your game with? Um, oh, there's, oh, there's so many questions. Um, if you weren't playing against someone who was quick and running behind, what was what was your like? What was the opposite for you? What what didn't you like playing against? So if you knew he wasn't he wasn't quick, he wasn't going to run in behind. Yeah, you know what? It's weird because. The ones who ran in behind, because I was quick, I enjoyed them ones as well. I didn't yeah. mind that race, and I, I wanted to showcase yeah. my good attributes. Yeah, um, I always found it difficult against the likes of Burkamp, Raúl, um, the Zolas, yeah. um, yeah. the players that come into their little pockets away from you. And and like you said earlier, which made me triggered my my thought about when I used to play is whenever I could touch someone and feel someone, I'm in control. Yeah. The moment I can feel you and I can see your shirt number and I can just see you, I'm controlling that situation. The moment I can't see you or you're on my blind side, you are in control of me. And those players like Burkamp especially, they they had a knack of just being able to arrive a little bit. They could ghost about a little bit and they would never play directly in front of me. Like they was never here, there. They was yeah. there over that side, over there somewhere, or to the side of me. It might have only been five yards. But the moment I've got to take my eye off the ball and do that, you're in control again. Right. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, this ain't even a question. Like, I just got to put it out there. Like, 
I'm an Arsenal fan and I ain't happy with you, bro. This season. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't happy with you. All just... that list is long and distinguished. Nah, man. I DM'd Mingzi, yeah, and he was just all he says to me is LOLs, and I'm not gonna say what we talk about, but like, either way, yeah, like just knowing it, like you lot ain't in my good books. Uh Rio, I this do. one's <laughs> this one's for you again, Rio. Um, relationships with key managers. Um, obviously, we assume you had a good relationship with Sir Alex. But if you can take us back, other inspirational people that um, helped you in your career? I think they all had something. I think Ollie would probably agree that they all have different elements and little something that they give you. I think David O'Leary made me captain at, at Leeds in the, like within a couple of months of me being there, which was phenomenal. But that's probably not the biggest thing that he done. He just spoke to me about preparation for games. Um, and I'd come from West Ham where it was quite a jokey environment and I got to, to, to Leeds and they were playing championship football, Champions League football. And I, uh, I went into the change room before a game and it was against Cardiff in the FA Cup. I got injured in the first, I think it was the first minute. I've done my ankle in a tackle. But the manager pulled me in on the Monday and said, Ria, I watched you in the, in the change room before the game and you, just, you were messing about with the lads, just joking about you going out to a game a big game, whether it's Cardiff or not. It's a big game. And you've got to be serious before the game. Get focused. Start thinking about your performance and whatnot. And it was the first time anyone had said that to me. I should just go into, I should just walk into games like nothing. It was not no problem. But and just that, that shift to really mentally prepare myself for games was a big thing for me. So he had a good influence on me. Harry Redknapp made me fearless of making mistakes. Always said to me, don't make the same mistakes. I don't mind you making a mistake, but don't make the same ones. Um, so yeah, little things, and obviously, Sir Alex Ferguson. I mean, the list is endless with someone like him. First call up, Rio. Sorry, I know we've gone a bit off topic here, but it's what we do. Can you remember your first call up where he was? Yeah, that's what makes me laugh about hearing Ollie and just seeing what his reaction was because it's like my mine was like crazy. Is what was, I was in a training ground and a fax came through. Who remembers faxes right there? A fax came through, <laughs> and the secretary at the training ground, Sue, said, Rio, can you come in here? I said, what's your, and um, look at the, the fax machine. And it had the England badge on it. And it was just, obviously, Rio, you've been selected to play for England. Uh, come to the squad. Like, I was like, the, the grin was from ear to ear. And you go outside and see it. And then it just starts filtering out into the training ground. Everyone hears and they're all coming up some congratulations. And you're going, cheers. Like, it's like unbelievable, man. <laughs> you're obviously telling all your family and that. But Rio, at 18, were, were you not taking that for... Was it 17 or 18? Were you not taking that for granted? No, because... I, 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 listen, Ollie's humble, but I know he, deep down he, he half expected to be in that squad at some point, I think, if, in his own heart of hearts. It's too, he can't say it, but I know deep... He must have thought, I'm scoring goals, and I'm better than him, and I'm better than him. I should be in there. And I was like that, even though I was so young. I thought I was... I knew I was a good player, but... And I thought I was better than, better than certain players. And so it's not, a, it, you are surprised, but also you, you think in, in the back of your mind, so I should be here as well, by the way. Mm. Are you like that earlier too or not? Yeah, I feel like I'm a bit too, um, probably a little bit too humble. Um, you know, no one likes anyone flashy and, and stuff like that and arrogant, but I feel like I need to, you know, when you're on the pitch, you need to be that man that's like, mm. give me the ball. Um, the humbleness goes out the window, you know. You can be two completely different people, you know, on and off the pitch. Um, and sometimes I feel like on the pitch, I'm the same person as I am off the pitch. You know, I'm, I'm a bit too nice. So I feel like it's, it's probably time to just believe in myself more and, and, you know, players don't have to like me on the pitch, but off the pitch, I can be a different person. Come on, say it with your chest. That's what we <laughs> want from now yeah. on, yeah? Come on. Uh, that's a good way to finish, man. Listen, we appreciate your time, man. Really, really do. And listen, the journey, the come up's been amazing. We're here supporting. So Vibe with Vibe is with you. Come back another time when you bang your hat trick in at the Euros. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you, guys. Cheers, man. Take care. Good luck.